Welcome back. You're watching the press preview here on Sky News. Joining me this evening is the Conservative MEP, Julie Girling, and the Chief Political Correspondent of The Guardian, Nick Watt. First, though, let's remind you what's on the front pages of those papers. The Guardian leads with President Obama's speech on the Middle East. The Independent has the Prime Minister's handshake with the Crown Prince of Bahrain as authorities there continue their violent crackdown against pro-democracy protesters. The FT reports on tension between the government and banks on the initiative to lend more to small businesses. The former RBS chairman, Fred Goodwin, is on the front page of the eye after the super injunction he obtained was lifted. The Times reports the super injunction was lifted ahead of the publication of an inquiry into the use of such orders tomorrow. The Telegraph has calls on the financial authorities to investigate if Mr Goodwin's affair affected the collapse of RBS. The Daily Mail asked the question if we had a right to know about Fred Goodwin's private life. And betraying his country is the Mirror's line on that story. While the Sun calls him, let's have a look, Fred the Bed. The Express goes with a different story, saying the EU plans to ban or impose a tax on plastic shopping bags. And the Star is comparing the revelations in the personal lives of Arnold Schwarzenegger and Tiger Woods. Well, let's go through some of those stories in more detail. Very good evening to both of you. Mm -hmm. Julie Girling, you are starting with The Sun, one of the many papers to cut, cover Fred Goodwin's revelations. Fred the Bed, their headline. Yeah, well, Fred the Bed. I mean, politicians, we, we quite like Fred. Well, we, like, we like him a little bit because he's even less public regard for him than there is for a politician. After the whole pension you know, how, uh, how issue. How low can he sink? You know, from Fred the Shred, he is now Fred the Bed. Um, getting even more opprobrium heaped upon him by the papers. I, I do think that there's a bit of a problem here, there's a bit of a confusion between the stories. There's a serious story about um, privacy, and then there's uh, I mean, the, the, the Telegraph. Um, Senior MPs and politicians want to know whether Sir Fred's relationship might have contributed to the collapse of RBS. Well, it would be kind of interesting to know, I suppose, if his mind wasn't quite on his uh, day job but how's that ever going it, to be it's proved not, though exactly and does it make a difference that he was having apparently having a a sexual relationship with someone he was working with or would it have made a difference if it was someone he wasn't working with or someone he met in the street i i don't know i i, I just think that uh, there is a story here, but it, it's not actually about mm. that. It's, Nick, it's, it's serious. Have it's the papers gone down the wrong road on this one? Well, I mean, I do agree with Julie that I think it's important to get a sense of perspective here. Obviously, there is a huge debate. Is it right that you're able to take out these injunctions? You have MPs and peers itching to tell us about it. There's a big debate. The Prime Minister has said he's not quite sure uh, whether these injunctions are a good idea because essentially do we have the courts deciding on a privacy law when Parliament should be making those decisions. But I do think Julie makes a very important point that you should get a sense of perspective. Uh, Lord Stoneham, who's the Liberal Democrat peer, um, who in a sense uh, got this into the public domain today, and John Hemming, Using who's the Liberal Democrat privilege. MP, who the Liberal Democrat MP who a couple of months ago actually told us about the existence of the injunctions, are now saying we need to have an inquiry. He was, uh, Fred Goodwin was having this affair at the time when RBS uh, went down uh, the plug and we had to uh, stump up 45 billion of taxpayers' money. I mean, I really do think the idea that RBS went under because Fred Goodwin was having an affair, I think let's get a perspective, guys, you yeah, know. It, it, do, it does tell you a little bit about the way these people perceive themselves, which in itself is interesting because... It, he, he felt that he was important enough, his private life was important enough to go for this super injunction. I mean, my attitude to that is I don't care less about your private life, Fred. No, but there it, are why does that imply that he thinks his life is important? All he's doing is trying to protect his family and his privacy. Why wouldn't well, That's the whole point with these super injunctions. That's what most people are trying to do. They don't want this to get into the public domain because they want to protect their families and, of course, their own <laughs> reputation. Yeah, but I think sometimes they draw more attention to themselves by putting themselves forward as being, if you like, um, able to, 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 to get them. them in yeah, the first exactly. place. Yeah, okay. it, exactly. It, 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 there's a kind of a, a, a rather unvirtuous circle here, which <laughs> I'd rather, you know, I'd rather not go into. If we, let, Let's forget about Fred the Bed, but let's think seriously about 
privacy laws. Mm. Well, that's exactly what the government are doing. They're yeah. due to make well, some announcements tomorrow. Well, Julie's right to mention that, and we can rely on my former employers at the Times to take the highbrow approach to this. Uh, and they're saying the dramatic turn of events put Parliament on a collision course with the courts and threw into fresh confusion the status of privacy orders. Now, what is interesting about that is that Jeremy Hunt and Ken Clark met earlier today and they agreed um, that the government would not introduce legislation for a privacy law. And what is interesting about that is that tomorrow on Friday, Lord New Neuberger, who's the master of the roles, is going to be outlining proposals on how courts should tackle privacy orders. And it gets back to this absolutely fascinating debate, which is the Prime Minister is uneasy about super injunctions because he thinks this is the courts uh, uh, basically uh, uh, taking the lead on privacy when he says Parliament should but the two cabinet ministers the culture secretary and the justice secretary who are the ones who would deal with this are saying this is not a matter for legislation in Parliament so once again interesting area but not quite clear which direction we're heading in I guess we've got to wait for that report by the master of the rolls on Friday Sh should we have a privacy law a law sounds to me a little bit um, of overkill, but then again, when I look at these papers, you've not just got Fred, there's pages about Chris Hoon, um, there are, there's Arnie and his, his extramarital. You know, the paper's absolutely full of this. Infidelity is, is very fashionable, it seems. But, it, but is, it, is it really a pub, of public interest, or is there just now so much of it in the papers that Actually, it's going to disappear naturally. I mean, we're all just going to get bored with it. And but sex go sells, away. and inverted commas, no, it, But you know what this comes to... down to? It comes down to our good old friend, the Euro European Court of Human Rights, which, and, the, and, and the Convention on Human Rights, which has in there an article which gives you the right to a private family life, but it also has an article uh, which talks about the freedom of expression. And the courts are having to sort of work and interpret mm. that sort of contradictory basis. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that's why it's a, I it's a difficult the, one. I suppose the interesting end game on this is, I, as I understand it, um, the conversations earlier today, uh, as have been reported, are talking about giving more guidance to judges on how they interpret the Court of Human Rights, uh, the judgments. And I, I do think that's an important way forward. If, if the government... Uh, are going to look at this particular issue and start looking at that forensically and, and giving judges advice, then I think that's probably the right way, not just on privacy, but on a lot of other issues Nick, with human rights. Just, just lastly on this issue, super injunctions, we've heard so much about it in the past few weeks especially, but I heard um, Ken Clark yesterday suggest that actually since John Terry, which was over a year ago now, there had only been two super injunctions that he was aware of. Do you know if that's Well, actually we all get correct? quite carried away with injunctions and super injunctions, and obviously newspaper headlines like to put, they can't put injunction, they've got to put super injunction, when sometimes it's not. There is a difference. Mm. A super injunction mm. you cannot even mention the, the existence the, the, of yeah. the injunction an injunction obviously has restrictions but you can mention the existence of the injunction and yeah I'm pretty sure Ken Clark uh, probably got that right I think there haven't been as many as we think there have been okay let's mm. move on to the next story that you've chosen and this is Dominique Strauss Khan breaking news tonight he has been granted bail uh, but he is tonight spending uh, a night in Rikers Island again while he gets together about one million dollars in cash. Let's take a look at the first paper that's covering this and this is there's a whole range of them today. Let's have a look at the times. There it is. Uh, no, it, yeah, yeah, wife six yeah. million frees IMF chief there. Yeah. You can see a picture of there of Anne Sinclair, Dominique Strauss-Kahn's wife and uh, their daughter Camille who lives in New York at the moment. We believe uh, Dominique Strauss-Kahn is going to be staying in her apartment on this uh, one million surety. Um, and we have saw them in court. A very difficult time for them. But how do we think the papers are covering this story, Nick? Well, obviously, it was a late-breaking story. Uh, and the Times, which has uh, pretty late deadlines, has got that on the front page, as you say, with a picture of Anne Sinclair uh, and their daughter Camille. And uh, the headlines going around is it's one million bear. Well, it's one million in cash, one million dollars, and five million dollars in assets, which Anne Sinclair has no problem. She can stump up six million quid at the drop of a hat because she's got quite a lot of money. Um, but it's saying here that the terms of the bail are going to be really quite stringent. It's saying here in the Times that Mr. Strauss-Kahn will have to wear an electronic bracelet on his arm uh, and he will have to allow a private security firm to track his movements. The guards will also be uh, watching him around the clock on CCTV cameras. In the United States, they don't muck around. Yeah, how's the FT covering this, Julie? Well, I've, I was interested in a... It was an inside page... Um, 
where obviously they're taking a, a, a serious look at um, succession and there are two there are two strands to this there's the strand of should it or should it not be a european and then because uh, traditionally it is it, traditionally it is and then that brings into play all of the other issues about the world bank um, american etc et um, the thing that caught my eye was uh, christine lagarde who has been tipped for it for a while now. She's the French finance minister. She's the French finance minister and certainly in Brussels um, very well regarded. Um, a great great polyglot. Um, she, I mean I, I admire her. I forget the politics. I admire her. She's a strong, mm -hmm. powerful, influential woman and I, I would like from that point of view to see Christine get a good shot at this and I'd, I, I'd hate the idea that she wasn't going to get a good shot at it simply because it's you know, it, it, it's all these rotating chairs, etc. Because I, I think she would be a, a really very she good She speaks choice. brilliant English and worked as a lawyer in Chicago and has seen quite good connections uh, with uh, Barack Obama's circle. But mm. it's interesting, my colleague Martin Kettle's got a very interesting column uh, in The Guardian tomorrow, uh, and he is saying that uh, Peter Mandelson, what about Peter Mandelson, former European <laughs> Trade Commissioner, and he's got a very interesting line in there saying that the Chinese have approached Peter Mandelson and said, would you be interested? Now, there's this big debate that Julie's talking about. Traditionally, the managing director of the IMF always goes to a European, the Americans take the World Bank. Big debate, why mm. shouldn't the emerging economies take what over a, a job like that would be. And <laughs> it would, would be, be and the thing news. is, the Chinese are now a hugely significant player. So if they're tapping up Peter Mandelson, mm. You never Maybe know. Maybe another comeback. Heard it here first. But he's not actually uh, Chinese. Let's you know, let's get that straight. <laughs> Peter Mandelson would still be a that. European, so <laughs> yeah. I'm not quite sure how that plays with the theme of you know switching away. Okay, let's move on to President Obama's big speech this evening on a lot of uh, tomorrow's front pages. The Guardian, in particular, your paper, Nick. What Obama tells Arab dictators: change or go. That's right. This was a very significant speech uh, delivered by Barack Obama at the State Department, deliberately done at midday uh, in the U U.S. time, so it could be watched in the evening in the Arab world. There was simultaneous translation in Arabic uh, and Farsi reaching out to, to, to that audience. And it's very interesting. He had two very powerful, important messages. One, I totally endorse the Arab Spring. And there's the Guardian, Arab dictators, dictators, wake up. You've got to change or you should go. But also a very tough message for Israel saying, I, Barack Obama, am committed to a two-state solution. And I'm not just saying that for the sake of it. I believe it. Oh, and by the way, the borders of a new Palestinian state have got to be based, this was the wording you used, based on the pre-1967 borders. And that sets up, interestingly, a meeting that Barack Obama is due to have, I think tomorrow is it, or next week, with tomorrow. Binyamin, tomorrow, Binyamin Netanyahu, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel. They've had some pretty frosty encounters in the past. Mm. Will they have another frosty encounter? Julie Gerling, President Obama, of course, has to play as well to his domestic audience. Mm. And there's a, a hugely influential Jew and Christian lobby who want to see the US continues to support Israel no matter yeah. what. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating that he's chosen this moment to make to make this speech. I mean, clearly um, the the Arab Spring, etc. But that he's chosen this moment to to start talking about Palestine because, you know, many people and I'm one of them believe that um, we we have a. All of the issues that we have with terrorism, if we just got to grips with what's happening in Palestine and actually faced it head on, started to talk about it, and you're not going to solve it, but he started the ball rolling, and I hope, I hope the ball keeps rolling and that we can get some good dialogue on this because he's been very brave. Okay, very well, brave. we'll certainly see in the coming days and weeks and months, of course. Julie Gerling, Nick Watt, do stay with us. We'll be back in just a few moments after this break when you can find out what is coming up particularly early this year. You can eat them, that's a clue. <laughs> For the first time on British television. Lady Gaga presents the Monster Ball Tour, Saturday at 9, only on Sky One HD.
My wife just doesn't understand. I can't sleep without a midnight snack. But Alice, she knows how I feel. To invest in a country with nearly 450,000 university graduates per year, please push the button. For more power to your global business, invest in Turkey. you can rely on. When Jersey Royals arrive, British summer is on its way. It's the climate and the soil in Jersey that give these potatoes their special flavour. I think they work best with smoked haddock lightly poached in some milk, then remove it to a grill tray, add some strong cheddar cheese mixed with breadcrumbs and put it under the grill. And then add some creme fraiche, butter and some chives to that flavoured milk. And what you end up with is a really good buttery, creamy sauce to dip your jerseys into. Pick up Delia's recipe card in your local Waitrose or go online. And right now, save a third on Jersey Royals and smoked haddock. Fly Cathay Pacific four times daily to Hong Kong and beyond. Hi there. Look at this. Grab the weed, stand on it, put it out, and it's done. Mind if I try? Go ahead. The Weed Puller. No weeds, no backache. Fist cars. Gardening that practically does itself. Wow. Exactly. You're watching the press preview here on Sky News. Coming up, what's getting a head start this year? Well, we will find out uh, with Julie Gerling and Nick Watt. Uh, Nick, you are starting the second half with the front of the Financial Times, first of all, and uh, some news from Amazon. That's right. It's a very good story by Andrew Edgecliff Johnson, who is the FT's media guru who works in New York, saying that Amazon have announced that they are selling more Kindles than they are selling uh, more books through Kindle, electronic books, than they are selling hardback and paperbacks, which is pretty astonishing um, because you thought Kindles have obviously really caught on. But the fact that Amazon is selling mm. more that way than through hardback and paperbacks is extraordinary. Amazon, and which started off its business selling books in the first indeed, place. Indeed, yeah. And, you know, for those of us who still have rather old-fashioned views about turning the page mm. of a book, and we like to look at books on our bookshelf... Well, Julie is, is not one of those well, people no, because Ju Julie is going she to is with the modern us. revolution. Tell us about the modern world, Julie. Well, I'm a great Kindle lover, I am. Um, I, I think they're terrific. Uh, it's cheaper. You could download a book. It's cheaper. For how Particularly, much? Particularly, well, it depends on the book. You can have one for 50p. French Dictionary, 50p. Um, <laughs> but if you want the latest um, hardback novel, then you'll have to pay, usually it's about a fiver less than the hardback. Uh, and then you move on. But um, I find it invaluable because I've discovered new things. I read more than one book at one time. Which I've never done before. Now, for example, War and Peace, always wanted to read it. <laughs> it's it's a, a task. Mm. Um, three years in now. <laughs> I'm, I, I read a chapter of it every night. And I would not carry War and Peace around with me to do that. And I, it's not a book I'm going to read from cover to cover in one, one sitting. So it's, you know, it's helping mm. to expand my literary horizons. But for me, for my lifestyle, I do a lot of travelling. I'm always on trains or planes or sitting in airports or um, even sort of... Even when I'm at home in my own bed, mm. I just find it so much easier. I can just turn pages. And I also get newspapers on it. So, yeah. you know, when I'm in Brussels, I get the newspapers on my Kindle. Well, there you go, Nick. I think we should try it. Absolutely. Julie's recommendation. Let's move on to The Guardian <laughs> now. And an incredible story on the front page of your paper, Nick. That's right. This is this story about uh, Rob Summers, who uh, is a former American basketball player who was involved in a dreadful car accident three years ago. Uh, he was paralysed and basically uh, the doctor said to him, you will not be walking again. And there is that amazing picture of him. 
and uh, he is beginning to take tentative steps. And uh, the reason why this is able to happen is, is because of his complete and utter determination. But there is new technology, and they're using electronics, ele electrical stimulation as a trigger. Uh, and it says here, I'm actually reading from the Times, uh, he was able to stand and move using feedback from his legs to adjust and balance. It's a really uplifting story. Combination of advances in technology, but the utter determination of Rob Summers to prove his doctors wrong who said that he wouldn't be walking again. Yeah, it's a great story. And uh, if page four of the Times has the take on it from Melanie Reed. And I, I don't know if you read Melanie's column in, in the Times magazine every weekend. Fantastic column. It's been going on now for, I think, about four or five months since she had, she had an accident. She, she had a, a riding accident, um, which I, I relate to because I have scars, broken bones from my, I've done a lot of riding in my time. and. Uh, She's, she is a fantastically inspirational person too, and it was from her, reading her column, I learned that it's not just about not being able to walk, it's about all of the other nasty incontinence, muscle wastage, all the stuff that comes with being mm. immobilized. And she, she writes a, a really interesting piece here about guarding against false hope. But but mm. knowing that you know deep down inside she she hopes this it's can help. It's a ray of light, her. isn't it? Yeah, Let's absolutely. Hope it really is. So um, Let, let's move on to the express because we're hoping you can shed some light on this story. Are the EU to ban plastic shopping bags? Oh, yes, this is this is the latest building brick in in the express's campaign to completely trivialise the EU. Um, it. <sighs> The, the, as I understand it, there's, there's a consultation going out. It doesn't mean it's going to be banned. It is almost impossible to imagine the EU could ban plastic bags across Europe. Certainly will be heavily resisted by myself and I'm sure most other UK MEPs in terms of what we would be allowing to happen here in the UK. I suppose the message is we don't need to be taught by Europe mm. about the difficulties of plastic bags. I mean, we in the UK have actually been leading on this. Yeah, well, so it turns it, out that it, this ban is a consultation document from the European Commission. I used to be the Guardian's correspondent in Brussels, and the one thing I learned is that when you're in this country, they think of Brussels and the European Commission as this terrifying body that tells us what to do. When you get there, you find that the European Commission is a deeply insecure body <laughs> that spends its life, in the case of Jose Manuel Barroso, the Commission president, living in fear of his life of the French president and the German chancellor that's where the power is London Paris Berlin not in Brussels not literally in fear of his life I well, hate not to in fear it. of his life but it's just it's typical it's hyperbole I mean right. there's lots wrong with the EU let's talk I about think... the real stuff not all right the real stuff bags. the important stuff and this is what we teased before the break what have we got the earliest of in 20 years something oh. we'll all be eating I imagine well. this summer you've got 45 seconds to tell us all about it this is delicious English strawberries forget all that imported rubbish that tastes of water and you know out of season delicious English strawberries coming early there'll be a long season they're displacing all the foreign ones in the supermarket they're great so, so get out there and buy fine. them as Andy Murray struggles we can do well with <laughs> we the strawberries we can nosh our Wimbledon. way through the strawberries off to Murray Mount <laughs> that's right eating your strawberries yeah. lovely Julie Gerling Nick what thank you very much for taking us through the papers this evening a great range of stories lovely thank you as the fog hangs warily over London, we can offer something to cheer you up. Well, it'll be a dry and chilly start to Friday for many places, but rain and strong winds will affect Scotland and parts of Ireland. That rain will quickly clear during the morning to leave a mix of sunny spells and showers across Britain and Ireland.